Hey everybody, welcome back to Bike Club, the monthly indie game club podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Nevin. And I'm your other host, Jesse. I corrected it. It doesn't say hose this time. Ah, uh, I wish it did. That was funny last time. I can fix it. Here. Nah, I'll leave it. It's just, fine. Just fucking say it again. Okay. And I'm your other hose. Je- I hate you. It's, 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 not the, it's not the same. <laughs> it's not the same. Anyways, uh, this month we're talking about David Sub... Sub- uh, fuck. I can't pronounce this name. I don't know. Zemansky, we're talking about Zemansky. David Zemansky and New Blood Interactive's Dusk. Uh, as a reminder, we will be discussing spoilers later on in this podcast. The first half is going to be completely spoiler free, and we're going to let you know when we're going into spoiler territory. So, Ooh, that rhymes. This is one of 18 warnings you're going to get. Count them. Quote me on that. Don't. <laughs> Um, so, okay, uh, Dusk is a first-person shooter in the vein of Quake and other 90s-era gothic horror-inspired shooters. Uh, David's previous work includes a handful of games released on Itch.io, such as The the Empty World, The Moon Sliver, and Fingerbones. The thing about his games is that they are all relatively spooky, and his strength in spookiness is kind of found throughout Dusk in a Mm -hmm. surprising quantity. Um, it's, it's a wild game and I'm really excited to talk about it. As am I. go ahead and dive on into the spoiler free side of things and jesse tell me your initial thoughts on dusk sure of course so uh my initial thoughts on dusk are that it's uh, the tightest shit ever it's so fucking good the coolest shooter i think i've played in a while and i played you know the first two new wolfenstein games uh first three new wolfenstein games actually if you count old blood um I mean, they're fantastic. They're fantastic games, but Dusk has just blown it out of the water in terms of capturing that shooter feel. I don't. It's a question I have for a little bit later, but uh, it really makes me think that like we're seeing two directions for how ninety shooters are evolving in the current space. Because you can look at the new Doom and this game, and while they're performing in similar ways, you can feel aspects of each that are very different, which is something I appreciate a lot. Uh, and this game is. Seriously, Dusk is like taking its weaponized nostalgia in the best way because it kills your wallet and makes you want to buy it multiple times. If it was on different platforms, I would buy it on different platforms and play it again. I hope they make an expansion. I hope they add modding support. I hope they do a lot of things for this game to keep it alive for a long time. That's how much I like it. I think that it's important to note, though, you you call it weaponized nostalgia. And like there there is a lot in this game that harkens back to the, the retro. Certainly, I don't want to make the uh, the the statement that like it doesn't do its own it new com- stuff. It absolutely it does its own stands new stuff. on its own. Sure, it's a whole new thing. But if you're big on Quake, if you're big on you know Doom, even or like Shadow Warrior, just for like the comedy aspect of it, uh, in certain points. But like if you're into any of those old shooters, then you're gonna love Dusk, and that's more what I'm getting at, and that they like know yeah. how to take that and sell that to you. This feels like the shovel knight for ninety shooters. Like they that's capture a really that fucking feeling. good way to put it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Yeah, they capture that feeling without exactly copying the older games, and they know how to make you feel like you're playing a game that you would have played when you were twelve years old or however old you were when you're playing ninety shooters. But it's you know today with better performance, better technology, you know, all that sort of stuff. So it's great. It is truly one of the best games of this year and maybe the last couple years. Um, I, I know when episode one came out for early access, I picked it up immediately and I was trying, I, I have tried for a long time to come up with anything clever or like unique or any sort of interesting take to say on this game. And the only, only thing I can come up with is that it's just really fucking good. Like, definitely, yeah, it is. It does do some surprising things um, when it brings in horror elements and, and what it does with level design and secret design 
and its aesthetic, it uses those in incredibly creative ways, and it's a very strong game visually. But it's just good. It's good. Yeah, it's visually satisfying. Um, I mean, like you said, like it's a fantastic looking game. I, I don't know what it is about us, but for some reason, low poly, 3D, dirty texture games seems to be our aesthetic in a weird way, which is man, which is surprising. Uh, I, I didn't yeah. think that's what we were going to be into, but it is. <laughs> yeah, we've kind of three games in a row. Yeah, kind of weird. I uh, didn't plan on that, but it's a good aesthetic. I'm big on it. Um, yeah, I mean, the music, fantastic. It, it, it puts, you know, music for the new games like Doom and, and, and Wolfenstein and like that. Uh, it, it takes the music for that and makes it sound almost bad. Like, I, it really does. So what's funny is like 2016's Doom has a phenomenal soundtrack. Um, yeah. it is It is one of the best in a long time. That's uh, Mick Gordon, correct? Yeah, Mick Gordon. Yeah. But Andrew Hoshult? Hush- 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 um, I think it's Hoshult, yeah. Blows it out the water in this one. Like, I I really enjoyed Doom's soundtrack, but I don't listen to it in my spare time. I do with Dusk's. It's so good. It's so good. And that's all, that's yeah. all I can say about so much about this game. I mean, the music has like this effect on you when you're playing. And again, something I want to get into later. Uh, but it just has this effect where it can both simultaneously get you hyped up and make you just want to shoot things. But it also like has the ability to scare the crap out of you and make you not want to be anywhere near the things you're shooting. It is so impressive in its emotional resonance without being like, a violin or a piano, you know? Yeah. It, it takes that sort of emotional weight that you get from those more classical instruments and applies it to the guitar in a way that I haven't heard in a lot of even, like, popular big games. They pull it off here in such a fantastic way. Like, I can't believe this is an indie game. Like, that, other than the visual aspect of it, everything about this game is phenomenal. Like, to the point that I'm genuinely surprised that this was a small team of, like, three people. Barely even. It's pretty ridiculous. I wonder if it points to or or sort of calls out an issue with not sound design, but soundtrack design in in the AAA space. Because I, I look back and I'm kind of hard-pressed to find a recent soundtrack that... Like, I can I think of the Dust soundtrack and there's a riff that I hear, right? Yeah. I, I, I hear the sound when you first start up the game and then there's like a da-da, da-da that like I hear. And with the exception of Doom and I guess Grease now or Gris, um, Gris yeah. and a couple songs from Paratopic, there's not a lot that calls out. Like God of War didn't have... I don't remember a single thing about that song except it was swelling and orchestral. I don't remember... Oh, I can think of the mom song like nothing, but I know what you mean. I, I don't remember a lot from Spider-Man except the theme. Um, yeah. I remember a few songs from Red Dead 2 because they, like, stand out. For the, for the most part. That's, like, three or four games out of, I don't know, a hundred games that released this year? More than a hundred? Yeah, I mean, yeah. You didn't play all of them, but yeah, I know what you mean. No, I didn't. That is very true. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, definitely. There's a, I mean, you can look over the last five, six years of video game music from AAA developers, and you're getting a lot of sort of lackluster OSTs in the same mm. vein that we've seen very lackluster music from, you know, movies. Disney movies or I from was Marvel gonna, movies. I was going to say that the, the movie space is doing a lot of the same thing with the, they play, it's playing it safe, really. Yeah, it is. that's exactly what it is. Games tend to, unfortunately, do whatever the big movie studios are doing because it's the most successful thing. I mean, it's safe. It's making money. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to deal with licensing and in five, ten years, nobody being able to purchase your game anymore or you having to make an update that has totally original music or new music that you've relicensed. Oh, man, so license, it just saves you a lot of trouble. music is so... I love it when they, like, use it well, right? But then yeah. we see things like what happened with i mean grand theft auto had that issue didn't it grand, grand theft 4? auto had it there was a game that was removed from steam recently alan wake alan, yeah, wake, alan wake was yeah. was removed and the, the Which it's is funny the only reason i actually played that game and picked it up was because people were like oh you should get this game because it's going to be taken off steam and it's one of my favorites now but i digress 
licensing in music is really risky. So you have to rely on creating music, but if you're going to do that, you want to make sure that it's safe and works right. Yeah, you don't want to make something that could be divisive or annoying or doesn't work in the scenes or, you know, there's so much going on. And because games are so interactive, unless you're making a David Cage-like game or something, you're going to result with, you're going to have a result of music that sort of doesn't work all the time. It has to be cut off at certain points. And Dusk does that really well as well. I mean, there's points where the music swells up and gets really exciting. It paces the music well with the games, yeah. It does. It definitely does. But there are, like, technically speaking, there are moments where you can be in a massive shootout. Clearly, the song's not over yet. But just because of the way they composed it, there are moments where the song can lull very easily. I don't know if they, like, pre-programmed that or if it's, like, some automatic system and I'm just not noticing the weird seams. I'm not seeing that when it happens. But it feels so effortless and, like, almost by design, despite my interaction not being there but you can hear the music ending and it yes always feels natural there's, it never feels like it's out of the way or like the song ended in the middle there's like a couple of riffs that they throw in there uh that they use to end songs and like depending on if it's the the pump up song or like the the more calm song like they'll throw that riff in there and then transition into the more atmospheric music or sounds that are for the level and it is so smooth yeah, it's very it's satisfying. Like that's I'm I'm hearing it now in my head. Like that's how well they did this. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> shooting feels great. These guns feel so good. I there's yeah, so I many mean, it, little it, things about these guns that I really enjoy. It's kind of hard to beat them. Like, like they're they're some of the best guns I've used in games in a while, honestly. Which is except the grenade okay, launcher. yeah, except for the mortar. The, the mortar's mortar not great. Or whatever. That thing can that yeah. thing can eat. But bullets. that has more to do with like the way the gun is supposed to be used. I found lots of opportunities to use it properly in the single player, but multiplayer, not so much. By the way, this game has a fantastic multiplayer side. It just has very few players. It's very hectic. It's wild. It's a lot like classic shooters, um, online modes like Quake and stuff and Unreal Tournament, but slower and smaller and faster it's like at the same time, like slower and faster. It's weird. It's like Quake through Arena if it were turned up to 12. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's not as as vertical as unreal tournament or as like quick turn ridiculous as some of the older shooters online modes are but at the same time it finds ways to be fast you know in, in different stranger ways because like ammo pickups are harder to get to you end up in an enclosed space or sorry an enclosed space so if someone happens to see you where you're going for ammo you're scrambling both to get that ammo and to fight back at the same time instead of trying to jump around on like the larger maps of unreal tournament and yeah, like you said, with Quake, it's kind of like cranked up still because it's still fast and it still requires you to move around a lot. And the character speed is ridiculous at all times. So you're always moving quickly unless you're holding the walk button. And even then you're still moving relatively fast. So yeah, there's lots going on there that, that changes it up and makes it feel different. It actually reminds me a lot of, uh, I'm going to sound like a weirdo saying this, uh, Double Action Boogaloo. Do you ever play that? Hell yeah! Yeah, it reminds me a lot of Double Action Boogaloo with less slow motion. Oh, I by that, love I mean no that. I haven't, I haven't thought about that game in a year and a half. <laughs> it's a great game. It's so uh, good. Yeah, it evokes a lot of that. Obviously, does, without the yeah. John Woo physics that's got going on, but it's it does a really good job of being that sort of fast-paced newer feeling shooter while still also evoking the 90s nostalgia of bunny hopping and strafe jumping and shooting uh projectiles that aren't all hit scan it's great and what i want to say is i i think it's pretty like another aspect of the multiplayer we played a bit last night uh we did 1v1s and we hopped into a server that was nearly full so like near 16 players and there's definitely a difference in pacing between the two because that's just how it is and that would be true for any game. But what I think is interesting is truly how different they feel com compared to each other. Because in, in 1v1s, it's like, okay, I have to find this guy before he finds me. He could be behind me. But when you go into multiplayer, there are 15 other people that could be behind you. And you have to keep your mind on your surroundings at all times. And it's a really interesting difference. And what I really like is... I want to say accessible, um, but I don't think it's quite right. But how accessible-ish they made the multiplayer. Because in a lot of the older games, in order to get the... It, it was harder to get those fast movements and those sick jumps and that, that smooth rotation around the map. 
it's a lot easier to get going fast in Dusk because strafe jumping gets you going a lot faster than just regular bunny hopping does. And it's a lot easier to execute than in something like Quake 3 Arena or the newer Quake Champions. Um, yeah. And some people will come around, come around and say like, oh, it's so easy to do that. What's the point, you noob? But like, <laughs> fuck that. It's, it's, yeah. it's good that everybody can do this because... Everybody can do these things that feel really cool. Like I'm, I'm bad at this multiplayer, but it's still really fun to jump around and just play and see people doing all these crazy things and do those crazy things. Um, just fix the grenade launcher, please. <laughs> yeah, the mortars got some problems in multiplayer or single player, which is a bit disappointing. But regardless, like apart from that, it's still a fantastic shooting game. Oh yes. Um, I mean, you know, everyone says that the best way to determine whether or not a shooter is good is if the shotgun feels good. Uh, here, every single gun feels good other than the mortar. Uh, so, <laughs> like, that should be a good indication that as good as you think shotguns feel in other games, it feels just as good for every other gun. Both of wild. the shotguns. Absolutely wild. Yeah, both the shotguns that you can get. There's a super shotgun, which is like your classic double barrel that fires both at once. And then there's like a longer range shotgun. Um, it's a yeah. lever action and you can dual wield them and it's very good. Yeah. All you really need to know about this game, if you're interested in buying it and you're kind of on the fence, you don't really know. You're kind of into shooters. You're not that big into shooters. Should I spend 20 bucks on like a three episode uh, 90s nostalgia fueled shooter? Uh, my recommendation would be Akimbo shotguns. Full stop. And that's that's kind of it. <laughs> that's it. That's all you need to know, man. Any game with Akimbo shotguns is is deserving of your money and time. It's it's a very good game. It does have some horror elements, which we'll probably get more into in the spoilers, um, because they are. Um, but they're executed very well. It's paced really well, and it's not that short of a game, depending on the difficulty you play on. Yeah, no, it's actually surprisingly long. It could be about three, four hours, I think. Each thing is about an hour and a half, depending on how good you are and, again, what difficulty you're playing. I had a lot of trouble with uh, with episode two. There's a middle point in episode two that sucks butts, but yeah, it's it's not too hard overall, as long as you've, you're have you fairly competent at shooting games. Uh, and, of course, difficulty modes, so if you're not having the greatest of times, but you want to see how it ends, which, uh, if you're playing it, I recommend you do. <laughs> it uh, Yeah, it's definitely worth... At least playing through, even on the easiest difficulty, if you're not used it to it. It also shooters, has um, for sure. a very neat loadout feature. So if you find your, like, mm -hmm. you spawn into the next level with um, <clears throat> whatever you ended the last level with. So, like, 13 health and no bullets, right? Um, and if you find yourself stuck on a level with that kind of start, you can actually go to level select, choose the level that you were going to be on, and deck yourself out with a loadout. And some people will say that's probably like cheating. It's really not because you're going to run out of shit. Like it does not yeah. make the level any easier. It just gives you more tools. Unless you're having the crossbow. That's the only time I would say if you're stocking up on crossbow ammo before you start, you're kind of cheating a little bit. Like you could literally shoot through the wall with a crossbow. So. God, it's so good. It's so fun. It's great. I love it. But if you stock up on it before starting an episode, you're you're kind of cheating a little bit. <laughs> I definitely did. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's why I said it. Uh, so, <laughs> you bastard! <laughs> there is one more Don't thing I want to mention about me. the game that I didn't... I'll shame you all I want. Uh, there is one aspect of the game that I didn't get to play around with. I wanted to know if you did. Uh, did you play the single player with Intruder Mode on at all? No. Okay, I didn't either. I don't know what that is, and I feel like an idiot for not knowing what it that starts is. The it makes you start each level with just the sickles. Okay. Okay. I thought it would be like a uh, if you Dark Souls sort of thing. Let me, let me tell you something. If you uh, mouse over the question marks in the menus, it tells you what things do. That's dumb. Who uses the help in games? I, what, are you a fool or something? I guess I'm a fool, but at least yeah. I learn. Yeah, whatever, dude. Learning is for nerds. Anyways. I remember hearing that there was going to be a mode like that, though. I may be thinking That's what I thought game. Intruder Mode was. Like, that's what I figured it would be. Intruder Mode being just sickles doesn't make any sense. <laughs> like, I figured that would be like a Dark Souls mode, like, where someone could invade your game. I'm looking it up, but it just brings up Dark Souls. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Doom that's why Eternal. I think that's what it is. It's Doom Eternal that's doing it. Okay. 
In Doom Eternal, you can invade other people's campaigns. That is dope. I'm big on that. Oh, yeah, yeah, that'd yeah. Be, they showed that in the thing. Be, I remember Yeah, that. that'd be really good in Dusk, too. Just saying. Yeah. Anyways. Um, David, so if you're listening fr- to this, please, for the love of God. <laughs> yeah, David, <laughs> use the import multiplayer button. <laughs> Just press the networking button. It's easy, right? Jeez. Who cares about packet loss? Whatever. Yeah, fuck it. I don't need stable connections. Anyways. I don't know what that is. Um, so for the first time in podcast history, of all podcasts ever, ever. not just ours, we have spoiler-free questions from our listeners. Um, as you know, we this is a, a book club style thing, so we ask you guys to send us your questions, and we will talk about them on the podcast. And this section usually goes after the spoilers, but we actually have some questions we can answer without spoilers, so we wanted to put them here for people who poop a doop 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 who haven't played the Goomy Doop. <laughs> <That's it>. Jesus, <laughs> Jesus Christ! Um, so our first question is from Kent McConnell. Uh, they ask: Is it fair to say that Dusk is the ultimate Christmas game, like how Die Hard is the ultimate Christmas movie? And um, I want to say. I didn't think so at first, but then they added Santa hats in, in, a, in a holiday update, and... Yeah, that would make it, it pretty Christmassy. I think I, I feel think you it, on that. I think I, I know think where you're getting it's pretty at. Christmassy. Yeah, I, you know, I don't disagree. Uh, so, no, uh, <laughs> <laughs> is my answer to that question. Uh, I mean, obviously not. That's not what the game's aiming for. It doesn't have any Christmas themes to it. Uh, no, but uh, Die Hard is also not the ultimate Christmas movie. Uh, it's yeah. not 2010 anymore, and I wish that take would go away. <laughs> Black Christmas yeah. is the best Christmas movie. Okay. I don't want to talk about this anymore. Next question. Uh, <laughs> it's actually a Christmas movie, though. That's fine. fine. Okay. Read the next uh, question. <laughs> I guess it does come down to like how you define Christmas movies, just, though. Just fucking... Just go. Sorry. Just go. Or bad. we're just going to okay. get into this forever. So, so Adam Nader, good friend Adam Nader, uh, asks... I haven't played it yet myself, going to within a week or so, but how Lovecraftian of a game would you say this Lovecraft game is? Because I gotta say, it looks uh, pretty friggin' Lovecraft, you know? Very. So, yeah, I mean, again, spoiler-free question right now, so I'm not gonna get into things. But, uh, definitely, uh, you're not wrong in thinking that it's fairly obviously got cultist overtones, uh, the sorts of enemies you fight can make you to sort of lead you to believe that something interesting is going on. And as you continue to play the game, things unravel in a way that if you are into Lovecraftian games, you may find some interest in. So I definitely, uh, if that's, if that's what you're looking for, which I know for Adam specifically, that's likely what he's looking for. You're not going to be disappointed. It's not, don't go into it expecting exactly that, but you won't be disappointed by what you get. Yeah. I think that there's some really good inspiration bits from it that I, it's it's hard not to see it at times, um, and I actually want to say real quick, um, our the the other show, very good show, the Writing on Games cast, uh, they were talking about their Game of the Year stuff, and they brought up Dusk, and this is I consider this to be pretty spoiler free, but Nico pointed out um, that the first episode is kind of like Shadow over Innsmouth. Yeah. Like it's it's got it's got the same kind of progression it's got to the it. city and everything at the end that's gone a little awry. I think, yeah, I think it's I. Yes, the answer is yes to your question, Adam. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So uh, I think I think that takes us out of spoiler free. So we're gonna head on over into the spoiler section now. This is a spoiler Ooh, warning. No spoilers, watch out. So so here here we go. Welcome back. It's a spoiler Whoa. zone. What's happening? Spoiler city. Spoil Spoilerville USA slash Canada. Population us. That's it. And That's hopefully it. you. All right. So as I've told you, Jesse, I did not have time to write down any freaking questions for this episode. That's okay. Because I've been dealing with a lot of BS. It is that time holidays. of year. It is. It is the holiday days. 
Well, uh, lucky for you, I wrote a bunch. So, <laughs> all right. So, um, sure. All right. So, uh, I think what I'm most interested to know, uh, right off the bat, in terms of the game itself, what is the coolest boss that you fought? Because this game has a lot of really fantastic bosses. Anyone that's played it will agree. I'm sure. Uh, it's just a series of great fantastic right. ridiculous bosses some not great uh honestly but for the most part just like a series of great bosses what's your favorite boss all right so do you want my favorite boss or the one you think i was the best designed uh i don't want your objective answer i want your subjective answer son of intoxicator okay he's okay. it's so cute really that's approach, your favorite boss you can approach that arena from a secret and it's got a little drawing yeah, no, it's cute. There's lots of little drawings like that, which it's I thought was fantastic. It's very cute. I think yeah, very funny. Not, not the twins that come after, mind you. They suck. Yeah. Um, But, like, I was very surprised by that. I thought it was very cute. And when I think back, with the exception of the final boss, that one's probably my favorite. Because it's just so... It's so cute. Really? It's not um the Arnold Schwarzenegger boss? I mean, that one was pretty good, but I killed him before he said anything. Oh, well, I didn't, so... <laughs> I it saw a boss funny. and I I had like full riveter ammo at that point, so I just fucking killed him. And oh, then okay. when he died, he said his dying thing, and it was like, oh, I should have let that one play out, huh? Yeah, that was my favorite boss, just because like I loved the comedy. It was so out of nowhere, and considering like everything you did before that level, it just was so funny. Like how ridiculous the fight is in that little uh, electrical warehouse and stuff. Like it's just. I was like so stressed out by the end. I'm like, I hope this is over. And then I'm walking over to the things, pressing the buttons. And then the, the roof opens up and I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> and then Arnold Schwarzenegger pops out like the worst Artie impression ever, by the way. I don't know who did that on the wow. team. Like, you're fantastic. And I love you. Like, that was just so funny. It was, ugh, I loved it. I loved it. I couldn't get over how funny that was. Yeah. I guess I'm going to have to go back and fucking fight him again. Let him, yeah. let him fight. It's a worthwhile fight. It's too bad you can't skip to that point because everything before that's kind of oh, like the hardest shit. <laughs> this game needs a boss rush mode. That would be great. Yeah, there's an endless mode, but I wish good. they included a boss mode in the endless mode. Unless there hey, is, and I just didn't notice it. Hey, Dave and David, <laughs> get on it. Import boss yeah. rush mode. You know, if you're looking to hire people who only have ideas and no, well, some technical skill. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we I know can, two I, people that I are I made us. a game. Don't look it up. <laughs> <laughs> it's bad <laughs> so uh i guess before we get into any any more questions do you have any sort of spoilery things you wanted to say about the game in general man fuck it's good i love the final boss i i love it that whole everything yeah despite about both of them not moments. being particularly challenging they were really cool fights they were extremely cool fights it was cool to finally fight like a human that moves like you and strafe jumps mm -hmm. and then it was great to find like, to, to finally fight, like, a real big Lovecraftian monster. Mm -hmm. Fucking Nyarlathotep, dude. Yeah. It was very... He... He does not get enough love in video games. Everybody's always talking about his younger, question mark, brother, Cthulhu. And, like, Big Squid Boy is cool and all, but give Nyarlathotep some love, man. He nah, deserves it. No. No love. He's not a squid. Get out of here. He's like a starfish. Look, nobody made a game called The Call of Nearlethotep or whatever, all right? So, his name can't be an alliteration. I don't care. The nagging of Nearlethotep. Okay, all right, you win. Actually, never mind. He's a good character. Ha <laughs> ha! I did it. Anyways, I mean, like, I, I have a lot of thoughts about this game, and they, like I said, it's hard for me to articulate much on this game because, like, it's just good. Like they're sure with the exception of uh, the massive reactor electrical warehousing with the lava floor and the mother boss, everything about this game was incredible. What I, I did not like that boss. And, and the fact that she then became a regular enemy was kind of lame. Yeah. Kind of like right after she became a regular enemy. I didn't have too much of a problem with that, but I did have a problem with, yeah, the fight was, the fact that you could fall off, I get it. Um, but I'm so glad fuck. I found the quick save button. I didn't use that. Oh, <laughs> I think I oh, died on that baby. boss maybe 12 times, maybe. You ran through the whole level? I can speed run that level. I, like, was 30 seconds off from the top time. 
Like, Damn. I can do that pretty fast now. That that was the level I discovered there was a save feature. <laughs> I I actually did not. I thought it was just like, all right, I guess this is just how it works for tension. And then I discovered that there was a save feature. And then I learned about quick saving. And I used that for the rest of the game. Like that, <laughs> that game had it had me so tense in later levels that I was like, all right, quick save. I killed the guy. Quick save. Cleared a room. Wow. Quick save. So you played the, it very differently. Because, like, the tension for me, I didn't even know there was a quick save button. So the tension for me was, like, through the roof. Oh, fuck. How was the uh, the the waves boss in that blue void? Oh, that thing. Yeah, the gauntlet. Uh, that's the not the gauntlet. gauntlet. The gauntlet's something else. But the gauntlet's yeah, I don't, before I know that. What you mean. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Uh, yeah, I mean, that was... I beat that on my the... second try. Fuck, um, really? Yeah, the first time I died when the moms came, and I was like, mm. I, hate, I hate them on their own. So I had to fight, like, eight of them. But I noticed while I was fighting them that they were just shooting each other. So I was like, yeah, what's it. good is that what's good is that you can kind of let the infighting happen. And that helps a little bit. But I, I was saving after each wave in that. Um, that makes and sense. I, I had to fight the horses and guardian like three or four times because I was I was only at like 12 health. So oh, I had wow. to beat the horses without getting hit more than twice. Yeah, I was. Uh, yeah, no, I got that. Like, I don't want to brag or nothing, you know, a pro gamer. Uh, but yeah, no, I got that on my first try because uh, the first time I played it like that level, I died on the uh, the moms and then I did it again. Got past those. No problem. Once I knew they were coming. And then uh, and then the bosses, there were three of them. I thought it was just like the guardian again. And I was like, oh, whatever. Uh, and, then, and then the horses showed up and they were like shooting their big fucking fireballs. And I'm like, oh, my God. So I'm just jumping out of the way, grabbing health when I can. You know, I think I finished it with like 20, 30 health or something. Jesus, uh, I finished yeah, that was it a really hard three. fight. Goodness gracious. Yeah, I got yeah, hit once and a, I was like, oh, God, no. It was a tough level, but it was really cool. I really enjoyed that a lot. I, I think that it was paced really well. Um, for sure yeah i love that the rats were there and like that was a surprising could have been one. a potential like they could have been a potential threat if you didn't like if you weren't able to see them they all do like what two three damage a hit and they're like 20 yeah. or 30 of them so if they all they're f- get on you that's almost all your health in one hit so and they're fucking impossible to hit yeah that's the only time the mortar is useful which is hilarious that's what i was just gonna <laughs> say i was like that's when i use the mortar when rats show up i'm like all right yeah. fuckers all right you're next sure uh so I guess my next question is, because I I think you'll have the same answer, but I don't really know. Uh, what was your favorite level? I really like a lot of the levels from episode one. I like the feel that they have. Yeah. Um, so you could just, like, pick one from episode one, and I probably really enjoyed it. Um, but I also really enjoyed the first level when you get to the sky area, uh, and you're, like, literally in the fucking sky and you're like fighting your way into a church um right yeah but i think my favorite has to be the level with the meat tornado okay not what i thought that's interesting really that's a cool level though i do really like that level a lot i like how you like go to different spots and like shoot stuff and that big literal meat tornado is coming towards the building and stuff that's so cool uh did you stand in the middle of that by the way like did you end up in the middle of the tornado at all no i didn't no, I didn't either. I just ran away from it. I'm wondering if there's something there. I never bothered I think to check you died. until right I, now. I went up to it and it started dealing damage to me. So okay. I was like, all right. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. I thought maybe there'd be something funny in the eye of the tornado or something. I, I, I know in the trailer for the game, uh, it like pulls you up around the outside. But I I did not have a lot of health, so I wasn't going to run that gamut. Yeah, that's fair. Even though you're quick saving yeah dude i don't just because i'm saving <laughs> no, doesn't mean no, i want to fucking die there's no problem with that i just thought that would have been the time to use it um okay well my favorite level is the escher level which is the one with the mom at the end yeah that level's really good too <laughs> despite actually. the mom being the worst boss in the game everything before that is so like weird and cool and the surprise of like what happens blew my mind like it's not anything particularly new. I mean, we've seen Escher like uh, visuals in games and, you know, swapping environments and stuff like that isn't all that new. But like, I don't know, the way the game implemented it's, it and the way it it's like done really well. Yeah. The, the climbing mechanic as well is really interesting. It makes you like look at the world in a different way. And in the same way, I like that level 
And I like the one where you're flipping gravity almost just as much for the same reason. That one was incredible. I, yeah. I gotta be honest. That was such that a cool very, idea. Very cool. So smart. I loved it. It kept throwing me off. Yeah. Like it would happen yeah. and I'd be like, all right, I have to think about this from a completely different direction now, which is not something that happens a lot in games. The flip kept fucking me up too. Because when you, when you land from a high fall, if you're looking down... Yeah, you roll, roll. and that's even worse. (laughs) And that's just that every time that happened, I was like, I know this is a consequence of an optional mechanic that I have turned on, but Jesus, I want to vomit. Yeah, no, that's fair. It was, I mean, like, I think it would be safe to assume that that's how the character would feel in that moment, too. So, oh, totally, whatever. Hashtag Ludo narrative resonance, bruh. Hashtag immersion. Um, yeah, I mean, so to be clear, there's no bad level in the game. Like, the level design is so impeccable. So impeccable. Like, I can't... Again, like I said earlier, I cannot believe that this is a game developed by one, two, three people. Like, just blows my mind. Everything about it. There's so much polish in everything. The the way things look. The only thing is, like, the default font from Dafont that, like, totally is all throughout the walls, which is almost more funny in its own way. Like, there's just so much going on that I love. And it's so weird and... The level design is so good. It's just everywhere you go, there's something new to find. Looking for the secrets just like makes sense. You see seams in the walls and stuff and that gives it away or you see different geometry or different textures. And like it's just such a good like, you know, when you're watching a cartoon and you can see what's going to move because it's different from the background. Yeah, it's it's like that, but like more subtle. It's so, you know, it's just so good. It's so, because you're moving so fast, like, just some of the time you don't notice that stuff. Like, I think back to the, um, one of the later worlds in, uh, or missions, rather, in episode three, I think it's episode three, where you're running around, uh, and you're tiny, well, tiny in quotation marks, it's like a bunch of gigantic geometry around you. That, you remember that? That moment was very good. Yeah, there's, so there's that little hidden secret there, uh, and if you go to it and open it up, there's like a tiny little chainsaw guy. It's hilarious. It's a, I think his name's like the neck breaker or something like that, or tiny neck breaker. Um, (laughs) It's super funny. Like, and I would have never noticed that, but I was just jumping around and then I stopped for a second to go pick up shotgun ammo. And I was like, oh my God, (laughs) like there's a secret. And it's just so cool. It's so subtle. Like the, the grass texture is a little bit different on the wall. It's so good. Like stuff like that is great. You know, it encourages you to go around and look at everything. It's, it's fantastic. I I can't believe that. The only games I can think of that have secrets that are pulled off that well. Like, again, as much as I like Doom, the secrets in that are terrible. Uh, like, you find something and it's like, oh, I found a little dude. Oh, I could play classic oh, give Doom. Him fist, give him a fist bump. Oh, boy. Oh, fist bump. Uh, but, you know, Wolfenstein uh, and this, like the latest Wolfensteins and this are the only games I can think of in the last, like, five, six years that have pulled off secrets that have actually felt, like, rewarding and good and interesting. Uh, I mean, Like, I actually want to go back through and grab all these secrets because... Some of them are just, like, different routes through levels or, like, some yeah. loot. But then you've got shit that's, like, really unique and interesting. Uh, is there, like, a finish the game with the soap thing? Because why is there soap everywhere? Why the fuck is there soap everywhere? I, I think it's the same thing as, like, the gnome I don't think so in, because uh, you, Left 4 Dead. you don't carry things through each level like that. Like, you can't take the soap to the next level. There might well, no, be not carry for... it through each level, but just get it to the end. There might be, like, find the soap in each level. I remember, Maybe, yeah. so, like, when Ep1 came out, I remember reading something about the soap, but I can't remember what the fuck it was, <laughs> so I don't remember what to do with the soap. <laughs> it's frustrating. Yeah, but, I mean, whatever. That's just a funny thing I was thinking about. I didn't even... And see, that really says how much there is with this game the fact that we both beat it and we're like still talking about like what happens if you do this what happens if you do that there's a lot of content there there's a lot to go back to so if you're looking for replayability difficulty different secrets challenges there's so much going on great game so if you've beaten it already and you're listening to this bit play it again if you haven't played it and you're listening to this bit you're a naughty naughty person uh but definitely go play it again or play it the first time rather did you know that you can flush stuff down toilets I did know that. I did. It's very good. I've, I've One of the secrets them. tells you to flush your sins away. It's great. It's very funny. Yeah. How important do you find music to be in a shooter? I find music to be important in pretty much every game. Certainly, but like, you know, you could play, like you loved Red Dead Redemption 2 and that game arguably has no music except for like the eight times it has to have music. Uh, 
So, you, you know, the game got away with that. Do you think specifically with shooters? Do you think like games that are solely about shooting guns? That's a really good question. And my gut reaction is very, right? But yeah. the more I think about it, I, I play Destiny without music a lot. I think it's one of those things that objectively you can probably leave or take, right? Okay. You can probably you can probably have it or not have it. What it comes down to is if the shooting's good, the shooting's good. If the level design is good, the level design is good. Music isn't going to help or hurt that. But adding music and adding it in a really good way can really amplify what's going on. Dusk would have been just as good of a game without its music. But by its music being there and being so freaking good, it's it's elevated. Yeah, no, that's about where I sit with it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, because I, I think like the game is as much a shooter as much as it is, you know, just like a cool experience at the same time. So the music helps in that aspect, but it's a cherry on top. Everything else has to feel good about it. It's what's driving a lot of the tone, really. For sure, yeah, yeah. Like I said, uh, it uh, does a really good job of making you feel pumped up and scared at the same time, uh, and like tense but adrenaline filled. It's really, really good at doing that sort of thing. So there are aspects of the games that require it. So yeah, I, I definitely agree where you're with where you're coming on that. Here's a counter question for you: How sure. different do you think Dusk would have been without any music? That is a good question. That's a really good question. Uh, I don't think it would be monumentally different to play like mechanically. I don't think you would approach the gunplay differently without the music. Cause like with doom, when you pick up the like doom 2016 to be specific, uh, when you pick up the melee item, like the power up that you get for that, 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 you know, different power ups give you different abilities, which this game has power ups as well. Uh, but when you pick up the punching one in that one, the music and the way it picks up and the sound effects and everything, that has a huge effect on how I approach the mechanic. Uh, I think if the music wasn't so hyped, I would just be running towards my objective and punching things where the music picks up in that and I just want to punch everything like anywhere. I will chase down an enemy that is in the opposite direction of my goal and punch it. Uh, where in Dusk, I was shooting everything anyways. Like even when the music was on a lull, I would shoot everything because I just loved killing the things. <laughs> it was fun to shoot the guns. Uh, don't quote me on that. I sound like a sociopath. Uh, but <laughs> You know, I love shooting the things, uh, but it was great. Like, so I don't think the music would change that aspect, but it definitely would make the ten like the tension of the game go away. Because a lot of that comes from the sound and the music and everything like your health going lower. Sure. But the music for me anyways was a big reason that I was so terrified at moments when it was dark, you know, you got those sort of twangy sort of like dissonant tones that really creeped you out. And that helped a lot with that aspect of it. Uh, in a game where you have like literally nine guns that most of which explode or kill things very quickly. How do you feel scared in that sort of setting? And I think they did a really good job of that. So I don't know if the tone of everything would work without the music, uh, but mechanically it'd be just, just the same. I think. I kind of agree with you. I see your points, but I think it would be a creepier game without music. I mean, that's inherent to a lack of music. Like if you don't set a tone and it's just sound effects, it's going to be scary. Like no matter exactly. what. Exactly. I think, I think that there would be less of a pump up and more of a, ah, oh, shit, ah, oh, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good way of putting it. Um, next question for you. And this is more of a specific one that I actually just came up with, but they put super hot in this game? Question mark? Yeah, that was really cool. Yeah, so uh I thought that was really a... really great. There's a there's a moment in the game where they're like taste the power and there's like a fucking red syringe and you pick it up and a bunch of enemies spawn and then it says time moves when you move and it was extremely surprising and like made me really happy to see that. They put they put super hot in this game. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic addition. Um yeah, there are loads of, like, interesting little, not loads of, but a couple, uh, really interesting little power-ups you can get that change the way you play the game or what you can do with what you have. There's the super shot, there's that one, and there's the climbing ability, and all three of them are really, really cool. Uh, but that one in particular is such an interesting mechanic and an interesting addition, but I also felt it to be a little annoying, almost, which sounds weird to say. 
it didn't function as as I was expecting it to. You know? Yeah, the initial payoff of it is really cool. Yeah, it's a very cool thing to like see happen. Yeah, but then when you're trying to kill waves of enemies, depending on the gun you're using, like it can be more of a pain than anything else. Like I, I assume using it, it's supposed to help you dodge projectiles more than anything else, right? But yeah. when they first give it to you, there aren't actually a lot of projectiles to dodge. It's mostly chainsaws and some small, tiny projectiles, but they don't get to shoot because you kill them before they can shoot. It's... Yeah, there are barrels that you shoot that explode along with that, which looks like, again, the, the payoff of the first time you get that is the coolest thing ever. Uh, and I wish I could, like, bottle that and sell it because that would make me a million dollars. But, yeah, once you've killed everything, once the explosions are done and you still have time to run out, you're kind of just moving around and shooting, waiting for it to finish, which is fine, but, you know, yeah, not a bad mechanic. Very cool. Very, very cool. But I wish, uh, I wish it did something other than just slow down time until you move around. Like, I wish it made your guns do more damage, like single fire weapons or something. That would be a little cheap, but, you know. Another thing to note, I think, is that in Super Hot, you can actually continue to fire or, like, the guns ready to fire faster. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you use the Super Shotgun when you're in slow-mo mode in this game in Dusk. You're going to um, shoot, like, three then, times and then it's going to run out. Well, not even. If you use the super shotgun, you super shake it. Uh, you shoot once, and then you have to wait for it to reload before you can switch weapons. But you have to you have to move. Yeah, in for order it for it to do all actually that. finish so the reload like... and then switch weapons. It takes forever. Yeah. Like it's it's a- a- absolutely aggravating trying to use anything uh, in slow mo mode. That's not the initial weapon that you started in. So yes. not a terrible thing, but not great either. I M O. Uh, I kind of wish it was everything else is slow and you're fast and the time that would have been slower. really cool. Yeah, that would have been great. Uh, like maybe it was only five or six seconds instead of the 30 or 40 you get uh, with the current mode. That would have been cool. Probably also a lot harder to program. Honestly, oh, sure. <laughs> like, everything has to be instance on its own. Um, so next question I have for you is uh, so the game really lacked in narrative purpose. At least I felt uh, there wasn't a whole lot going on in terms of the story it was telling. Which isn't a bad thing, but I am curious, uh, did that bother you? And do you feel as though that approach to storytelling in indie games, that sort of vague non-storytelling, is overdone or is it uh, something that you still welcome? I'm kind of glad that you brought this up. Um, I think it's fine. Let me just start off with that. I think it's fine. It didn't bug me. And we talked about something like this in the Paratopic episode, experiential storytelling. The, the story of this game isn't some shit that came before or some shit that came after. The story of this game is what you are playing through. And I I didn't find it vague. It's just the story is what you were doing. You, well, you are the story. So you're experiencing it. My point is, is the more that there are elements of the story that are being told when you look at certain things. Like if you look at... so So in the second last level or the last level... Uh, one of the houses you go through to turn on a button, there's a bunch of paintings that are being hung up uh, and they have pictures of people. And one of the people you see is is Jacob himself. But you see pictures of like people who could be family members, maybe his parents and him, something like that. Um, and maybe I'm reading it wrong, but that really did feel like that was sort of, you know, saying something about his family. And there's different stuff you find along the way that sort of like alludes to there being a little bit more going on with the cult and everything. Um, and this isn't so much a point that I'm making about Dusk specifically. Uh, Dusk as a shooter, I think, doesn't really require much of a plot. Uh, I mean, Doom, you know, got away with its very minimal plot and it doesn't really matter. As long as you have a decent setup for what you're shooting and why you're shooting it and why you're seeing it, that's really all that matters. Um, so, the you know, I'm only asking that question from a general perspective of indie games. Do you feel like it's something that we're getting too much of or do you feel like it's something that could be explored further? I think it's fine. I think it can be explored further. I think that that sort of storytelling, I think you can do a lot with it. There may not have been enough here in Dusk. I Now that I, like, you clarified, I understand a bit better. Um, there may have just not been enough of it in Dusk for you to really... Because in order for that storytelling to really work, you have to hint at enough things for a puzzle to be pieced together, right? Yeah. The only puzzle piece that we get here is that at one point, your character had a normal life. Now he doesn't. There's there's all that, how did he get here? You you start the game on some meat hooks, right? 
Like, there's not enough for you to really piece together, or I missed a lot of shit. I, I don't have an issue with that kind of storytelling at all. Sure. Okay. Yeah, no, me neither. Like, uh, again, with this game in particular, it, it really doesn't matter because of the genre and because of what it's trying to be. Uh, so I think intent-wise, obviously I can't I can't read David's mind, but it's a great game, uh, and the storytelling in it is perfectly serviceable for what it's trying to do just had a general question about indie games there yeah uh, yeah because yeah, yeah. that's what we talk about on here <laughs> you uh and i guess my last question that i have that's a uh, sort of direct one do you think this game is an homage or an evolution of the 90s fps genre and this is something we touched on a little earlier in the non-spoilery section but if you have any further uh, further points to make on it that aren't related to uh to non-spoilery stuff so if you want to get into the game before making that point feel free i think it's an evolution um because as as it it does pay homage like there's there's no denying that there are so many little things that that this game does with interactables enemy design uh the weapons you use and all sorts of stuff like that and even even the final boss is an homage uh quake ends with you is it Yarlet the tip that you fight in Quake? It might be. I think it is. Um, oh, sorry. It's Shub Niggeroth. It's it's a, it's another one of the Elder Gods. Um, so like there there is so much about this game that pays homage, right? It it is an homage. There is no denying that. But it's also an evolution, in, and you can see that in the way that you know it it uses a lot of modern game design it, it knows when to pick and choose from the old stuff to and, and it knows when to not use things that have not aged well making it it's 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 not a 90s shooter it's not it's it's a 2018 shooter that has paid attention to the things that we have learned since 1992 yeah no, that's a good way of putting it for sure i think that's uh I, I kind of already gave away my stance on this, but it's definitely, I feel like it's an evolution of a classic genre more than it is an homage. Um, I mean, like I said, it's it's the Shovel Knight of 90s shooters. It just is. Uh, yeah. And that kind of goes along with what you were saying, uh, that it's more focused on finding what didn't work in the 90s and getting rid of that uh, and sort of trying to stick to what worked. And fleshing that out for an era where we have better mouse tracking, for an era where we have, you know, uh, better keyboards even that have better key rollover and, and don't break if you press more than two keys at a time. Uh, you know, just stuff like that in general. So it, it's taking the equipment that we have to play the games that, that's better, taking the hardware that it has to do more interesting things with its visuals um, while still staying true to that look. And I think that's the biggest thing is that the look is very specifically like a 90s shooter yeah yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. to a t like you'd be hard pressed to think this isn't a mod for quake just like initially looking at it um but yeah it's it's very very good at what it does uh i'm genuinely impressed that we got a game that's like that and i mean if you look at shovel knight right like i said it's you can see a lot of what makes a great you know 80s 90s platformer but like you said, it's taken those elements and built it for 2018 in a way that feels so natural, like a natural evolution of the 90s shooter, despite that being more than now 20 years ago when, when those games came out. So, yeah, very, very, uh, very cool. Very impressive. I'm very impressed by this game. That's really all I had. I, think. I guess we might, uh, might as well move on to the viewer questions here. Yes, let's move on to the viewer questions. We got our first Email question. And it's a it's a big one. Uh, this is from friend of the show Jared, aka the Playing Field. Um, so I'm just gonna read this whole fucking thing off. <clears throat> howdy Jesse and uh, howdy Jesse and Nevin. Uh, playing Dusk, I was amazed at all the little systemic things that I hadn't expected in the game, such as picking up and throwing objects, especially gas cans, for damage. Explosive barrels spreading fire to flammable objects, and wood objects like boards and trees splitting apart. It struck me as immersive sim-esque, but when I described this to a co-worker, he said it just sounded like regular old interactables, which gave me pause. 
I've heard others describe some of the aspects as immersive sim-like, and the devs are open about their appreciation for Looking Glass games. Do you think describing Dusk as having immersive sim aspects is appropriate? Is the wider use of immersive sim as a, de as a descriptor now devaluing its usefulness? Very good questions. Thank so, you, Jared. It is a very, very good question. Um, so, I mean, immediately there are elements of the game that I would say are absolutely systemic. I mean, there's that gem you could use to make enemies turn against other enemies, which is great. Um, so there's elements like that, but there's not enough for me to point at the game and say it's systemic. Like that's kind of the only thing I can think of where the user's interaction with the systems of the game influences them. Cause you're really, your only other form of interaction is shooting things, shooting things um, yeah. which isn't a bad thing. That's what a shooter should aim to do but but yeah certainly there's there's elements of it hidden in there if you look close enough but for the most part i would refer to it as such and to your second part of that question uh it we definitely haven't devalued it yet because we're still getting games like red dead redemption 2 which yes that game started development five years ago but we're still seeing like what systemic means trying to figure out like how you make things interact with other things in ways that feel natural but also are possible within the space of a finite system like games. So there's a lot to that that I think we have to work out before we can get to the point where systemic game becomes overrun in the same way that we sort of are overdoing and over discussing open world. We're not at the point yet where systemic I think is overused just because like how many systemic games truly pull it off in a way that feels good like MGS five and breath of the wild like you know like open world games specifically like you can point at like a hundred classic games that are like that but but newer games i don't think it's it's really run its course just yet but we're we'll, we'll a couple of years we'll get there i think three or four years we'll see a lot of games try to do it and and fumble it a lot and, and that'll get a little yeah so i pretty much fully agree with you but i think it's important to note that uh he was asking about describing things as immersive sims not oh, necessarily bad. describing them as systemic and well, i, think I would say an immersive a, game I, and a systemic game are kind of the same thing, right? I, because uh, how would no? you define an immersive game compared to so a systemic in, game? An immersive not, game not is just like you interact with systems. In a, an immersive sim. An immersive sim, sim, right? Right? sim is what I mean when I say immersive, okay. game. I say immersive okay. game. It's the same thing. Okay. Um, immersive sims are built around the the systems that they give their players to toy around with. Immersive well, sims. Well, then would you are, call Breath of the Wild an immersive sim? I've talked to Jared about this before, I think, and the answer is yes. Hmm. Okay. I, I, I would consider it very immersive sim like because it gives you all these systems that interact with each other. It gives you so many systems that interact with each other. And it gives you a lot of different tools to use within those systems. And it says, here you go. It presents you with the problems. And then you have a toolbox that you can pull from to solve those problems. That, in my mind, is what makes an immersive sim. That's that's the baseline. Um, Deus Ex does this. Even, even the new ones, whether or not you consider them more RPGs than immersive sims, they do this. Um, and, and a game that's just systemic or has a lot of systems or even a few systems that happen to interact with each other, if it's not built around the player utilizing those systems in whatever way they really want, or even a handful of ways, then it's not an immersive sim. It's a genre game with some different systems that interact with interesting ways. So I I wouldn't call Dusk immersive sim-like. I, I don't think that describing things as such devalues the term. Um... But I think that describing a lot of things as such is a sign of us trying to really figure out what we can shove into that genre. I don't disagree. Like, systemic game, when I'm saying that, I'm more just saying that, like, a game that has systems exists. Uh, like, immersive sim and systemic game, I think, are kind of the same idea. As I much think as they're hand in hand. I think they're the same idea. Like, it's, I get what you're coming from but immersive sim is kind of just uh, like a nice way of saying deus ex clone 
right? Or like System <laughs> Shock clone. That's really what it is. Like first person shooter is just a nice way of saying Doom clone, right? I mean, that's where we came from. And now you, you sound like an idiot if you call something that, but that's where the phrase came from just so we could not make everything sound like it was Doom. Um, that's kind of exactly what it is. And systemic game to me just sounds like the evolution of that concept. Like how do you escape uh, a phrase that kind of belies a certain aesthetic? Because when you say immersive sim, I think... I think Deus Ex, I think System Shock, I think, you know, Bioshock, anything that ends in the word shock. Um, it's, you know, it's stuff like that. That's what I end up thinking of. First person games with sort of wonky inventory systems and mini games and systems where the characters interact with each other. But like, you know, I, I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with systemic game and immersive game or sorry, immersive sim being sort of synonyms for each other. It's the same general concept. Uh and I guess more specifically to, to Jared's question and not to arguing semantics, uh, you know, there, there's certainly nothing wrong with, uh, with overusing that term, like the same way that there's nothing wrong with overusing RPG or anything like that. Genres in general aren't interesting. I don't like having the discussion because it doesn't matter. Uh, as yeah. long as the two people having the conversation are aware of what they're talking about, then it doesn't matter. The only reason anyone argues about genre is so that they can feel like they've won the conversation. Yep. Like that they're the right one. It doesn't really matter at the end of the day. So don't let your coworker get in your face about it and uh and don't do the same. Yeah, beat <laughs> them up. Is my take. Beat beat the crap out of anyone who tries to tell you that anything matters if it's about video games. Just Not have like fun, physically. Play them. Don't like physically harm them. Oh, beat them up online. No, really beat them. Like with the <laughs> real human fists, please. <laughs> I the monthly wide or the bike club podcast does not condone violence. Thanks. Uh, the co-host does. Uh, so okay, can't, <laughs> just play it. I'm just gonna playing. gonna have to gonna have to make you add a description to your Twitter profile. My opinions are my own. All right, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so the next question uh, is from our good viewer listener friend Kent McConnell again. Uh, he's got another question. Do you think it's insensitive to massacre an entire religious institute just because they worship a cosmic horror known as Jacob? Uh, nope. So just to be clear again, uh, I don't condone violence. That was a joke earlier. Um, <laughs> and I, <laughs> outside of the context of the game, I also don't condone it. Uh, I mean, the whole reason that you're shooting those things is because they're shooting you. And that's kind of where I draw the line on that. Self-defense, obviously. Uh, yeah. I don't want to get into a, a moral discussion on whether or not violence is right ever. But um I mean, you know, if an entire cult was trying to kill me, I wouldn't not kill them back, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. That's that's full stuff there. Yeah. Though I do want to <laughs> clarify, they're not worshipping Jacob. They're that worshipping Nyarlathotep. All right, bud. Yeah. And <laughs> still no is the answer to that Give question. me Give me a big stop on that. Yeah. So. It's a yikes for me. Yikes out of town. Our, <laughs> that's a yikes, chief. Ooh. Um, epic. All right, so we have one more submission, which is two questions and a comment from friend of the show, Puking Goombas. Uh, he says, "Man, number one, how cool is it to be in very different environments throughout the missions? Two, very cool. Which weapons did you guys end up using the most, and which one did you use least? Sickle doesn't count. And three, not a question, but I love the gun twirl button replacing the reload button." Okay, so let's tackle, I'm going to go in opposite order. order. Oh, opposite order? Let's go in order? opposite okay. order. All right, I think all right. they're better questions than opposite. So, okay, three. Amazing. Yes. It's so good. Uh, it's so fucking good. The gun twirl being reload is hilarious because I have this very bad tendency in shooters to reload after I shoot my gun precisely one time. I, I think um, everybody has that. Everybody. I want to assume so. I think anyone that does anything creative does that. Like, for the same reason that we all press Control-S as soon as you left-click the mouse on anything in any software ever. Oh, my fuck. How um, many times do you hit Control-S? Like, I save, like, three or four times. Literally, on my old keyboard that had sticker keys, that sticker was, like, coming off. Everything else was fine. Like, Control and <laughs> S were coming off. That's how much That's I pressed. Awesome. I swear to God. So I swear good. to God. I wish I was lying. Um, yeah. It, uh... It's very It's good. super cool. It's great. It's, it's hilarious, because it's not just, like... You hit it and the weapon that you have in your hand spins around. Each weapon spins differently. So the arrows and the crossbow flip, but not the whole crossbow. Yes. Like that is hilarious. That is so funny. This game is like genuinely hilarious at times. Like some of the stuff you can interact with, this doesn't have anything to do with the gun twirl, but some of the stuff you can interact with, the uh, the paintings, the computer picture you can find. Yeah. Picture of a dude, like uh, just a random dude. I know it's supposed to be Jacob in the end, I think, but like 
you look at him and you, and you interact with it and he says he looks like a cult met leader or whatever. That's great. He could have been goofing on me. Um, but when Ep1 released, I took a screenshot of that picture of the dude uh, and I tweeted it to Dave Oshry, the producer. And I was like, hey, is this a picture of you? And he was like, you got it. <laughs> that would be very funny. That would be very much like George Romero. It, and, it, uh, is, it is now officially a picture of him probably from like high school or something. The the computers in the game are all like playing. Dust yeah, I don't have time to you... play with myself as well. It's which so is really funny. good. I love yeah. it. I love There's all it. that sort of little things like that, that the little details are really funny, really great and make it add a lot of personality to the game. Like you can feel like you're making a game made by someone that's really passionate about 90 shooters, which is great. And someone who just likes having fun with the feeling, which is awesome. Yeah, exactly. So two, which weapon did you guys end up using the most and which one did you use the least except for the sickle? I probably used the riveter and the, the double shotties the most. Yeah, yeah, Akimbo shoddy is number one, no question. Despite so it having good. the lowest ammo, it was just it's really versatile. Cool. Yeah, it's great. I mean, it's got the range. Um, it's got the damage. It's it's great if you're accurate with it. It's a really really good weapon. Um, the least is the mortar, no question. I so I've talked a lot of shit on the mortar here, and I'm here to bury the hatchet with the mortar because as garbage as it is, I actually use it a fair amount. Um, I found it pretty useful. It's like a, a, a weaker riveter. And I, I actually used it a decent amount. I didn't like it, but I used it. It saved my ass. Uh, I would say least for me is probably the sword. Huh. Except for that That's one really level. That's really interesting. Yeah, the one level where they give you the sword and they're like, hey, stealth, by the way. It's super cool. I, I thought that yeah. level was super. Okay, I changed my answer from earlier. That's probably my favorite level. Um, okay. Because it was it was such a uh, a diversion. But the sword is super cool. You can block attacks with it, right? That's yeah. really cool. But I just shoot them, shoot them with the guns. Yeah, exactly. Just just shoot things. It's a shooter, not a stabber. Um, Damn. Uh, something that I thought was really interesting with the sickles. I don't know if you noticed it. You probably did. You're you're good on catching the mechanics and stuff. You can hit the shots back. Yeah. With the sickles. Yeah. 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 You can also shoot the cool. shots out of the air, like with your gun. You can shoot projectile weapons, like projectiles coming out of the guns. You can shoot them and stop them. Yeah. Like I noticed that while you were doing the super hot mode. I really just fun. dodged them. Yeah. Well, you know, we're not all godlike gamers that can dodge bullets, man. What, what are you, Neo or something? Get out of here. Yeah. I, the truth come out. Is <laughs> Finally, he, he admits we live in the in the matrix. What, what pill did you take? Say red pill so I can say your I red pill, both. please. Uh, okay, that's not good. Uh, so <laughs> I'm going to die. Sorry. <laughs> now, what's the last question? Uh, how cool is it to be in very different environments throughout all the missions? And it's super cool. It's super great. I love it. I think it. it's more all the episodes and all the missions. Some of the missions take place in sort of the same place. Um, but I get like, what you Throughout you're the episodes, it's it's extremely different. Yeah, you, you go from place to place and it always feels like you're in a different environment. Not in every episode, but, but relatively frequently, which is great. Yeah, I know. I love that a lot. Uh, it really speaks to how talented... David and the rest of the people who, which again, I don't even know if there's really that many other people, uh, are at developing something like that. It's, it takes a lot of effort to make one really cool level, but here you've got 30, well, 28, uh, the last two levels are kind of the same levels, which isn't a bad thing. I really enjoyed that. Um, but like you get a lot of really cool design, a lot of intricacies in the way things look and they work and they... You know, what was what I able to cram in thinking about the architecture of the world in terms of the secrets and like how you as a player can kind of piece it together because of how things look like if you see a grate and there's something in there, but there's no way into it. You know, there's a secret because there wouldn't be geometry without a way to get there. Like, it's great. Like, all that sort of stuff is really, really good. Um, and I love it. It's just it's so smart. So. So, yeah, it is really cool to be able to go into different places every mission that are totally different environments and you're not going back to the same spot multiple times in different missions every mission's a different place it just looks similar which is really yep. cool yep 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 full agree you, you took the words right out of my speak hole <laughs> i like speak hole it's good <laughs> it's, it's not good it's it's actually quite bad i like it whatever <laughs> all right so i i think that's it so we're gonna go on over to the good old outro section and uh do that stuff All right, 
so thank you again for joining us for this month's episode of Bite Club. Next month's game is Celeste. Uh, so Jesse, take it, take it away, yeah. bud. <laughs> Dude, ne- next month's game is Celeste, like my good friend Nevin here said. Uh, it's a hardcore 2D platformer where you play as a little girl named Madeline as she attempts to climb Celeste Mountain. I don't really know if she's a little whatever uh the the game is essentially a series of self-contained challenging platforming sections all taking place along your path towards the top of the mountain celeste has some beautiful pixel art along with some of the best games music of 2018 that was developed and published by matt thorson previously known for his work on towerfall ascension a great multiplayer game along with his team at matt makes games incorporated you can check it out on steam itch.io switch PlayStation 4 and Xbox One for around 20 US dollars off sale, but you can usually find it on sale for a little bit cheaper. Yeah, so that's going to that's going to be January's game. I know I'm going to be I'm going to be picking it up on Switch probably since I'm going to be traveling next month. Good move. Just make it easier to to keep Great up travel with that. game. And also, yeah, like I I want more games on my Switch. I don't want to freaking play Smash Bros for the 4-hour drive down to San Antonio. What 8-hour? <laughs> eight 8-hour eight drive. It's 4 Yikes, hours to yeah. Austin, 8 to San Antonio. Going to be so good. So yeah, that's next month's remember to send us your questions. Uh cuz you know, as always, we take your questions, we talk about them on the podcast. Uh there are a couple ways, three in fact, that you can send <laughs> that you can send them in uh you can email them to nevin at indie-bytes.com you can use the contact form at indie-bytes.com or you can just send them to me on twitter when i tweet out saying hey send us your questions uh if you email if you email questions don't put any spoilers in the title might still be playing the game all that good good stuff and lastly it's time for a little bit of bookkeeping this episode as with all our other episodes was edited by miles with a y so Thanks, Miles, for Ooh, using your time dude. to edit this stuff. Yee Thank yee. You. Uh, you can find Jesse's content on Twitter and YouTube at Chadunda. That's C H A D U N D A. You can find more of my own crap on Twitter at IndieBytesYT, <laughs> on YouTube under IndieBytes, and at Indie Bytes.com. The music used in this episode is from the Dusk soundtrack by Andrew Hoschult. Uh, the soundtrack is actually currently unreleased, but dear lord, they better drop it soon because I had to record this stuff from the game myself. Oh god. Please uh, put it on vinyl, by the way. And oh my I god, I would it. love to have this on vinyl. I don't even have a record player and I'd buy it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, big same. Get get with Fangamer. They do, they do vinyls all the time. Yeah, um, I would buy the collector's edition, no question. Last thing I have to say, thanks for talking about our podcast on the Twitters and, and telling your friends. You can talk about this on Twitter with the hashtag Bike Club. That's B-Y-T-E-C-L-U-B. Uh, you can also use the hashtag Indie Bites because why not? And if you are looking for a quick way to tell your friend about this podcast, um, there's actually a page on the website, Indie-Bites.com slash Bike Club. Uh, just... Take that thar link and send it on to them thar friends you got. And tell them about our podcast. It sure is the South in here, ain't it? <sighs> gee, gee whiz. I'm going to go play Red Dead now. <laughs> uh, so thanks again for listening, everybody. We are looking forward to getting your questions. And we will see you next month in January 2019 for Celeste. And we, you know, we didn't say it at the start of the cast, but if you're still here and listening, uh, you know, Merry Christmas if you do the Christmas, Happy Holidays if you don't, if you do whatever you do, marry that, uh, and uh, you know, have a have a great New Year, have a happy new, have a happy New Year. Get get your resolutions if you do those. Get drunk. You got this, if champ. That's what you do. If you if you drink, if you don't drink, don't get drunk. Don't drive after. If you do get drunk, don't, by the way, please. Don't drive after if you do sober either. Yeah, don't just don't drive. Don't drive. <laughs> don't drive. <laughs> All right. (laughs) We'll see you guys next time. (laughs) Bye.